Welcome back to another video on the China Mathematical Olympiad 2020. In the previous videos, we have taken a look at the solutions to problems 1 and 4. The links have been placed in the description below. Right now, let us take a look at problem 2. Let integer n greater than 1 be given. Find the smallest positive integer n such that for any integers a1 to an, b1 to bn, we can find integers x1 to xn satisfying the following two conditions. First, there exists an index i such that xi and m are co-prime. Second, sum of aixi and sum of bixi are both divisible by m. So to begin this problem, I will set up some notation. Firstly, let d be the number of distinct prime factors of n and we write all the prime factors of m as p1 to pd. So we can write m in this, uh, in this fashion over here. It's useful to consider the distinct prime factors because then basically condition 2 is the same as saying that sum of aixi and sum of bixi are divisible by pj to the power rj for every j. And for condition 1d is saying that there exists at least some index i such that xi is not divisible by any of the primes p1 to pd. For the solution, I will prove that the smallest n that works is 2d plus 1. This may still seem a bit random, but it will, the reason for this will become much more intuitive after the next slide. So on this slide, what I will show is that n equals to 2d does not work. You can use a similar construction to check even smaller values of n, but I will not go over the details. So to show this, uh, that n equals 2d does not work, I will need to produce the integers a1 to a2d, b1 to b2d, for which I can never find the x's satisfying the conditions. The way I will do the, produce the ai and bi's are as follows. Now let's take a look at a1. How will I pick a1? I will pick it such that it is congruent to 1 mod p1 but congruent to 0 everything else. Similarly for pi, uh, for ai, I will pick it such that it is congruent to 1 mod pi and congruent to 0 everything else, all the other primes. And I can always do this using the Chinese remainder theorem. On the other hand for a d plus i, what I will do is I will just pick something that is divisible by all the primes. For b's, I will do the reverse. b1 to bd will be something that is divisible by all the primes, whereas bd plus i will be congruent to 1 mod pi, but congruent to 0 all the other primes. And why am I using this uh, construction? So let us take a look at what happens to condition 2 uh, when we look at mod, mod pj. So uh, if you look at mod pj, right, we see that across the row, right, we have everything is zero except for a single one under the column ai. So this forces the sum ai xi when taken modulo pi to reduce to just simply xi congruent to zero mod pi. So taking mod pi forces xi to be divisible by pi. Similarly, let's look at the b's. If we look at mod pi, what happens? Everything in the row is 0 except for a single 1 under b d plus i. So the sum, sum of b i x i is congruent to uh, just x d plus i under mod pi. This forces x d plus i to also be divisible by pi. So if we want to meet condition 2, we see that we can just uh, look at the equations mod the respective primes and this forces every single uh, xi to be divisible by at least one of the primes p1 to pd. So condition 1 cannot be met if we want to meet condition 2. Just as an aside, now we see that this idea is actually not too far-fetched because the whole idea is we want to use condition 2 to force x's to share common primes with m. So what better way to force x to take up a certain to be to take up certain value than to have one 
in uh one and the rest of it being zero in a in a in each row. So with a bit of experimentation, you can actually uh be led to this construction. Okay, so we have shown uh that n equals two d does not work. Now we will show that n equals two d plus one works. And if this is just an extension of what we showed in the previous slide. Actually, what we want to show is that each prime factor of m can destroy at most two x's chance of staying co-prime with m. And the way we'll do it rigorously is to establish the following lemma. So let us be given a, a fixed prime p and given any integer k, positive integer k, and given any integers a1 to a2, 2d plus 1, b1 to b2, d plus 1, you can find integers x1 to x2, d plus 1, such that p divides at most two of these. And at the same time, pk divides some aixi and pk divides some bixi. Okay, so the thing to note is that in this lemma, actually only the mod pk values of the axes matter. So I can change the axes around as long as when I take it modulo pk, uh, they are unchanged, then the conclusion of the, the lemma still holds. So the p will still divide at both two of these and pk will divide the sum, uh, the two sums here. Okay, so before proving the lemma, let us see, let us first assume the lemma and show how the problem is completed. Recall that m can be written in this form. So what I will do is I will apply the lemma to each uh, prime divisor of m and for the power, I'll take it to, the, to be the power rj. So when I do this, I get a, a bunch of condition on the, I, I get a bunch of condition on the mod pk values, right, of the axis. I can apply Chinese remainder theorem to find the axis that fit all of the mod p to the power of r values. And how does this finish the problem? Well, firstly, well, all the p to the power of r divides the sum, so condition 2 is met. But at the same time, because for each prime, it divides at most two of these x's, there will be at least one x where none of the primes divide it. So this will conclude the, the problem. All that remains now is to prove the lemma. And the way we will prove the lemma is we will prove by induction on k. And it's important to note that we are not fixing uh, the a's and the b's in advance before inducting on k. Rather, for the proof, we will, we will proceed level by level where for each level of k, we have proved the statement holds for every possible choice of a's and b's. And then move on to the next level of k, prove that statement holds for every possible choice of a and b, and so on. And now I'll be proving the lemma. I'll do so using tools from linear algebra to help me along. So uh, it's possible to convert all of the language of linear algebra into pure number theory terms, but I'll do so to showcase how linear algebra can sometimes be used to solve certain Olympiad problems, even though it's not expected that most contestants will have that knowledge. So the base case is uh, k equals 1. And what we'll do is we'll put together the a's and b's into this matrix form and view it as a linear transformation from fp 2d plus 1 to fp squared. So fp is the, the few formed after the integers are taken modulo p. So although the ai's and bi's are integers, when in fp, the ai's and bi's should be read as their equivalent classes. Since the range has dimension at most two, the kernel has dimension at least 2d plus 2d minus 1. And now let us look at what the divisibility conditions translate to. So the condition that p divides some aixi and some bixi is the same as saying that uh, because this, this sum here right can be written as mx and the fact that p divides the sum is the same as saying that mx is equal to 0 in fp squared. Yeah, x here is the column vectors consisting of the xi's. Since the kernel has dimension at least 2d minus 1, there exists a vector in the kernel with at least 2d minus 1 non-zero coordinates. Having non-zero coordinates means that p does not divide, divide that term. 
So this vector yields the desired x1 to x2 d plus 1 because there's at least 2d minus 1 that is not divisible by p. So the base case has been proven. Now we move on to the induction step. Assume that the statement is true for k minus 1 and we want to show it for k. There are a few cases to consider. Firstly, the we will start with the more difficult case. So firstly, the, consider the case where the ai and bi, these vectors span fp square. Now we apply the induction hypothesis to obtain xi such that well, some ai xi is deserved by pk minus 1, some bi xi is deserved by pk minus 1. So in mod pk, I can write these expressions for some a and b. By definition of span, I will find yi's such that this linear combination is equal to a, b in fp square. And now it's just a matter of subtracting away the yi pk minus 1. And why does this work? Well, because the axi gives a pk minus 1, right? But the a y's together gives a. So the a y pk minus 1 gives the capital A pk minus 1 that's needed to cancel away the original a pk minus 1. So we get 0. Similarly, uh, the y with the b here give capital B, and so it will cancel away the capital B pk minus 1. And we can let this axis uh, be the new axis because we are just subtracting away a multiple of p. When we subtract away a, a multiple of p, right, we get uh, the axis having the same remainder when divided by p. So the condition that p divides at most two of these is, no, is not violated in, in this modification. So this is the general name of the game that applies to the subsequent cases. For case 2, we have span of the vectors have dimension 1. Suppose that first that the span is generated by 1 lambda when lambda is not 0. Since the b is a multiple of, uh, is lambda times of a, we can write in this form b equals lambda a plus p times l because uh, if it's in fp, b will be a multiple, lambda multiple of a, but outside of fp as integers, we need to add the p times some integer. And this is the important part, we apply the induction hypothesis to the a's and l's, not the a's and b's, but the a's and l's. And we can do this because, remember for each step of the induction, we prove that the statement holds for any given integers, not the a's and b's, but any given integers. So, we can apply it to a and l as the given integers to obtain the axis such that some aixi divisible by pk minus 1, some lixi divisible by pk minus 1. So again, mod pk, we can write it in this term, in this form for some a and b. By definition of span, there exists y such that this linear combination equals a times lambda a, and same thing, we subtract the y pk minus 1 to cancel away the a pk minus 1. And for the b's, it's slightly more tricky. Uh, we, we, let's go through this. When we expand, we have b x i, which I written here. This is b, this is x i, and then we have b y p k minus one, which is here b y p k minus one. Okay, firstly, the l y x i is over here, right? So when you multiply by p, we, this term will already become divisible by p k. So this part disappears, and then over here we have a i x i which is a p k minus 1, right? Multiply by lambda, we have lambda a p k minus 1. So this is lambda a p k minus 1. But here b i y i is lambda a. So same thing, this part is lambda a p k minus 1. So these two terms cancel out, we get 0. The same game, we can let the new axis be the, the new axis basically, because we are only modifying by a multiple of p the axis will have the same remainder when divided by p. Case 2b is that the span is generated by 1, 0. Well, the, there's one more case where it's generated by 0, 1, but the argument is symmetric. This time we apply the inductional hypothesis to the ai and biop as the given integers. Again, we write, have, can write this in this form, in this form. Same thing by definition of span, you can find y such that linear combination equals capital A0. Then same thing, subtract away the y's 
and then the A's will cancel out. For the B's, it's uh, slightly different. Uh, from this expression, we see that BIXI with the P move over is already divisible by PK, so this disappears. Uh, BIYI is uh, equal to 0 in FP, so we have a factor of P here times PK minus 1. This is equal to 0. So same thing, we can let the new XI's be the new XI's. And, and last case, the last case is where the vectors i x i are all equal to 0, 0. So very similar argument, we apply induction hypothesis to a i over p, b i over p as given integers, obtain x i such that we can write it in this form. And this time we don't even need to modify anything because move the factor of p over, we see that some a i x i is already congruent 0, some b i x i congruent 0, mod p k. So there's no modification needed for this case. So what do you think of this problem? I know that the proof of the lemma is a bit tedious, uh, but actually there is just only one trick in linear algebra that is being used over and over again with slight modifications between the cases. So it, it's not as bad as it seems. And also with a bit of experimentation for the main problem, I think it's quite natural to be led to the solution 2D plus 1, and it's not too hard to show that 2D doesn't work. So it might be possible to get partial credit for this problem even if you are not able to prove the lemma. So let me know what you think of this problem in the comments below. Stay tuned for more math problems and see you soon.